So uh, as was mentioned, I'm actually a gastroenterologist. Does anyone know what a gastroenterologist does? We're not a proctologist, but we do uh, examine and treat patients with diseases of the GI tract. That's the esophagus, stomach, intestines, large intestine, pancreas, liver, etc. So I'm a gastroenterologist, and I see patients, my area of specialty within gastroenterology is dealing with colorectal cancer. I see young patients, like some of you, sometimes in my clinic, because you have a strong family history of colorectal cancer. I'm a gastroenterologist, and I like what I do. I also love football, <laughs> okay? And you guys recognize this place, right? It's down the street, yes? So this is U of M Stadium. And you see this little yellow group in the northwest section? That's you guys, right? Okay? So big student population, everything. This is the big house. However, this stadium represents something that deals with colorectal cancer. It takes this stadium plus another third of this stadium to represent the number of people who get colorectal cancer in the United States. It's a lot of people. This stadium holds 109,901 people. And half of this stadium dies every year from colorectal cancer. Okay, so why do you guys care about it? Because even though you guys are in the Northwest section, there's some of you that will get colon cancer even at a young age. The majority don't, but there's some that do. And also, the precursor, you know, the colorectal cancer just doesn't happen overnight. You develop a precursor lesion we call polyps, such that the things that you eat and some of your background genetics affect the growth and the, uh, that polyp to develop. By the time you're age 50, a quarter of us will have polyps in our colon, okay? It's, it's a pretty common disease. Now, this is so important, we want to detect them. We've invented more than seven ways to detect polyps in the colon. Some of them are shown on this slide. We have ways to use contrast to show the large intestine or colon. We have tests in which you take small samples of your stool, and your parents probably have done this, um, and sent them in to the doctor to determine if there's evidence of blood or any genetic material in the stool. We sometimes even use CAT scans that can detect uh, polyps. These are all detection tests. All these tests also have variation on their accuracy. Some of them are less accurate than others, but all of them have been shown to actually save lives for the most part. And there's variation in the test costs. Some of these tests cost as little as five or six dollars, all the way multiple thousands of dollars. Now all the tests I show you on this slide are detection tests. They, find, they hopefully find things. Ultimately, all of them lead to a test we call colonoscopy. Colonoscopy has emerged to be the most preferred test by gastroenterologists. It's an awesome test, okay, <laughs> as a gastroenterologist. You use a flexible camera to go up the rear end and look through that large intestine. So it not only detects things, but we can actually sample and remove them. So it's a diagnostic and therapeutic test. But it does require the patient to do some extra things. You, get, you have to take out a clean out solution. So it's a large amount of fluid that you should take usually the night before or the day of to clean yourself out. How many of your parents have done this? Oh, they groaned about it, I'm sure. That's the worst part. You have to take a day off from work because we usually give you sedation for this test. And it's usually two people who have to take the day off from work because not only the patient, but you as the driver, as their son or daughter. It also has some risk. There's a risk of bleeding or infection sometimes, and there's, some of that's been in the news recently. But there's also a small risk, about one in a thousand can have a perforation, which means actually poking a hole through the colon. Irrespective of that, it's still the best test. It has emerged as the gold standard for detecting and removing those uh, precursor lesions we call polyps. Okay? Uh, because it's the preferred test, 
and it's the test recommended by most of the gastroenterology organizations out there. there um, how did it get to that point? There are a number of items to consider that bring that test as the most valued test to gastroenterologists. First, I mentioned the cost. There are federal guidelines by an organization called the U.S. Preventive Tax Force that looks at cost of tests and how effective is that cost for saving lives. And colonoscopy, despite its expense and its risk, is very cost effective. How efficacious, it's the best test, it's our gold standard for detecting polyps and cancers. There's been so much studies that's led to guidelines for when we start screening uh, patients and how we use this test. The performance, as I said, is the gold standard. And there's some safety, as I brought up, even in with one in thousand, it's still a fairly safe test with those caveats at risk. So that efficacious, that amount of the safety profile, irrespective of what I said before, still leads value to detecting these things at an at a appropriate time point before it turns into cancer. Now, whoops. What is the standard time for us to get screened? In the absence of a strong family history or a high-risk condition, the average age for screening is age 50, 50 years. And generally, if that colonoscopy is negative, meaning no polyps or cancer found, you don't need another test for 10 years until age 60, et cetera. That accounts for two-thirds of all the patients in the country. So two-thirds of patients will fall under that average risk profile, starting at age 50, getting something 10 years later. If you're high risk, such as shown by this family tree, if you have a large number of family members in your, fa in, your, in your family tree that have had colorectal cancer, for instance, that screening may happen earlier. So that's the exception. But for two-thirds of the population, age 50, every, every 10 years. Now, prior to around 2001, the use of colonoscopy was probably ad hoc. 2001 was the first time Medicare, which is a government agency that funds ins health insurance, paid for colonoscopy. And certainly when STARS advocate, people listen. Anyone recognize who's on this screen? Uh, that's right. This is Katie Couric. Her husband died at age 43, 43 from colorectal cancer. He was one of the unfortunate young people, even below the age 50, because he had a strong family history. But Kay, after Katie got over her grief, she went on national television as one of the uh, uh, leads for the Today Show and had her colonoscopy performed on live TV. <laughs> okay? That resulted in the year 2000, before Medicare paid for it, a 20% rise in colonoscopies. 20% by one person, that's amazing. So driving up awareness is excellent. However, some issues could dr drive the inappropriate use of colonoscopy. From the patients, and I should mention that in this country, we spend $3 trillion in healthcare costs. And it's estimated that at least 10% or $300 billion is excess costs from abuse and overuse. What are some inappropriate drivers of costs? Well, from the patient's perspective, you're bombarded. I'm sure this, this show is being tweeted all over the place. But you're bombarded sometimes with good information, but sometimes unclear or misleading information, leading to trying to get these tests at a more frequent uh, interval. You may hear that your friend had cancer. And certainly, you should uh, have yourself uh, evaluate it whether, but you're not related to that friend. But sometimes that drives the test as well. Am I clean or clear or overinterpretation of your family history might drive this. So getting the correct information is appropriate. From the doctor's perspective, fear of lawsuits, capitulating to those ease, uh, to ease the fears, fears of patients, having, uh, doing something habitual without 
consulting or learning about updated guidelines for the use of colonoscopy. Oh, in a physician's case, sometimes over-interpreting family history could lead to excess colonoscopy. And sometimes the financial incentives are not properly aligned, even between physicians and insurers for the use of colonoscopy. So what has happened? Insurers, like the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, or other insurers, are starting to mitigate costs. Did you know that the cost of a colonoscopy in a hospital might be different than the cost of a colonoscopy in an outpatient endoscopy center? Did you know that? CMS does, and they're trying to mitigate and even out those costs. What if the endoscopy center uses an anesthesiologist? Every colonoscopy doesn't require an anesthesiologist. That drives up the cost. So CMS and other insurers are talking about bundled payments. That is, payments to the doctor or the hospital for everything involved with the colonoscopy, whether you want to use an anesthesiologist, a pathologist, or whatever. And you decide who's going to keep that money. So they've gotten involved. Companies have gotten involved. I have a picture of here of Safeway grocery stores. Back in 2009 and 2010, Safeway was looking at the cost of insurers to the insurance to their employers. And then their, the health care insurance was going up too fast. So they looked at a number of procedures, including colonoscopy. And in particular in the state of California, they did a survey, something we call price transparency. And if you looked at, you know, two, three, four hundred places that did colonoscopies in California, they found the range of $1,200 to $8,000 for the identical procedure, okay, no matter where you went. And so they took a median of that, which was like, let's say, $2,500, and they told their employees that you can get your colonoscopy anywhere you want as long as it's $2,500 or less. Guess what happened? The guys that were charging $8,000, they were losing some patients, they dropped it down to $2,500. So companies can control the cost. That is called reference pricing, by the way, and that's becoming more and more complex in the medical record. Now, you may say, what does this have to do with me? Well, a lot of you raised your hands about your parents getting colonoscopy. Now, if they went to an $8,000 place, okay, and said, oh my goodness, um, I have to spend my excess money instead of on your tuition, you'd say something about that, okay? Science has gotten involved as well. Science has shown that if you have an initial negative colonoscopy, let's say at age 50, and there's evidence that 10 years later, if you offer another colonoscopy, which is a $2,500 test, let's say, or if you offer a $12 test, such as one of these others, you may have the same number of life years after that. So it may not make a difference as long as your initial uh, colonoscopy is negative. So you should learn, ask, get accurate information. Uh, you know, knowledge is power. The American Board of Internal Medicine, which certifies internists and gastroenterologists like me, has started a campaign called Choosing Wisely. It's a way to educate physicians and hopefully their patients about correctly picking things based on guidelines or evidence-based uh, medicine. Uh, and this campaign was started just a few years ago. The idea is to take something like colonoscopy and give you the best cost and value to you and your parents, your aunts, and your uncles. I'm going to close by saying March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. You know, the best tests for you and your parents, or anyone who's appropriately be screened, is the test that gets done. All those tests I showed you are still cost effective, and colorectal cancer still kills people. And you should recommend to your aunts, uncles, parents, uh, if they're over the age 50, they should get screened. And if you have a strong family history, you should see, talk to your physician or go over to student health and find out more information and pass that information on. But colorectal cancer still is the second leading cause of death in the United States, and one out of three people still don't get screened. 
So pass that information on. Thank you.